Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today, we are going to return to Jane Roberts and one of her very first books called How to Develop Your ESP Power. She has a chapter on telepathy where she talks about telepathy and asks the question, do we pick up the thoughts of others? How do we distinguish these thoughts? And what happens in the process of one thought being sent to another person? And then Seth also is channeled and answers some questions about telepathy. So if you're interested in telepathic abilities, this is an outstanding episode to learn more. She begins by saying, contact a distant relative or friend without writing a letter or using a telephone. This may sound improbable, yet it is very possible that all of us can do this on a subconscious level a good deal of the time. In fact, such telepathic messages may be received so easily and smoothly that we act on them automatically without giving them any conscious attention at all. The Russians have been experimenting with telepathy as a method of communication between Earth and space vehicles. The U.S. government is experimenting in the transmission of telepathic command to volunteers aboard Polaris submarines. Telepathy could conceivably end up as a weapon in some future war. But what about telepathy thought transference in ordinary everyday life? Here are some experiences told to me by a neighbor, a teacher in his 30s. Coincidence is a possible explanation for any one instance, yet when we consider groups of such happenings, certain patterns seem to present themselves, which make coincidence less likely as an explanation. One weekend morning, this neighbor felt a sudden strong impulse to visit his sister. He felt particularly impelled to go to her house for dinner that evening, though she lived 40 miles away, and he was not in the habit of making such a trip unless he planned to stay for a longer period of time. That afternoon, he finally decided to make the drive. As he left his apartment, the phone rang and she returned to answer it. His sister was calling him. She asked him to drive down for dinner, saying that she had thought about calling him all morning, but hesitated. She did not think that he would want to make such a long trip for such a short visit. Finally, she had decided to call. Apparently, in this case, the actual phone call was quite unnecessary. My neighbor had already received the message and was acting upon it. On another occasion, this same gentleman made up his mind to visit his brother, who also lived in a town about 40 miles away. Although he had looked forward to making the trip, he suddenly felt an urge to put it off for a while and take a short drive around town. When he returned home, the phone was ringing. The call was from his brother, who was at the local airport. He had flown to Elmira purposely to see my neighbor. The two see each other infrequently. Had the teacher made the automobile journey, he would have missed his brother entirely. Only his illogical urge to put the trip off for a while made the meeting possible. Some experiences of my own. These particular incidents and the ones just mentioned represent fairly insignificant occurrences. We often shrug them off as a coincidence, without giving them further thought or consideration. Later in this chapter, we will be concerned with some experiences that are not so easy to forget. Last New Year's Eve, Robert and I met a young couple. Call them the exes at a party. The following afternoon, as I sat in the living room, someone knocked at the door. Instantly, I knew that Mr. X was at the door and that his wife was not with him. This proved to be the case. One afternoon later in the year, Robert was late coming home for lunch. The idea suddenly came to me that he had quit his job, though there was no reason for him to do so particularly, and he had not spoken of doing so. I was concerned thinking that if he left his position as a commercial artist, he might have to leave town as he works only on a part-time basis, and in a small town such situations are difficult to find. Yet the idea was distinct, he had quit his job and we were moving out of town. No sooner had I received these thoughts than Robert returned. Our friend Mr. X was with him. Mr. X had come to see us purposely to tell us that just moments before he had quit his job. He and his wife were moving out of town. He had met Robert outside the apartment house on his way to see us. Here, apparently, I had picked up on Mr. X's thought, but because I was consciously concerned with Robert's tardiness, I attributed the message to him. 
Here's another instance a friend gave me a coat which she had discarded. The friend then moved away. A year passed. I never had worn the coat. One day last winter, I decided to wear it downtown. As I put the coat on, I thought, if I wear this, I'll probably meet AR who will remember the coat and know it is a hand-me-down. AR had been present when the coat was given to me. I was tempted to take the coat off, but as I had never met AR on any of my trips downtown, I decided it was idiotic to suppose that I would meet him on this occasion. So I wore the coat. When I completed my errands, I stopped in to see another friend who works in a store. I had no sooner put my hand on the glass door to enter when I saw AR talking to my friend. I had visited the friend often in the store, and AR had never been present. The following is another simple incident. Again, this experience could also involve mere coincidence. At 7.45 one morning, as I did the dishes, I suddenly decided to return a neighbor's plate that I had borrowed. The thought was strong that I should do so. I picked it up and started for the door, then remembering the early hour, I put the plate down. Just as I did so, there was a knock at the door. This same neighbor called, wanting to borrow something from me. In our five years as neighbors, he has never knocked at the door so early in the morning. I gave him the plate. One evening, I went to a nearby grocery store, telling Robert I would return immediately. On my way back, I remembered that a friend had a book of mine in which he had borrowed but not returned. I decided to stop and see if he was finished with it. He is a professional man with his office in his home. The book was in his office. As he was busy, I had coffee with his wife. We talked for an hour. It was winter and a dark night. Nervously, I thought that Robert would be concerned about me by now since I usually return from the store at once. My eyes darted to the clock. It was 7 p.m. Finally, I decided not to wait any longer when I reached home without speaking robert gave me a piece of paper on it was written 7 p.m strong feeling that jane is at dr x's now robert did know the man had a book of mine but i had passed his house often in the past without ever stopping to get it other friends of ours lived between our apartment and the store i could have stopped to see any one of them most readers can recall such experiences of their own at the time the incidents impress us to some degree but we feel we can prove nothing by such accounts. It could be adequately explained by many other means besides telepathy. Telepathy is, however, one possible explanation, and it should not be entirely discounted simply because it is not the only one. The following incident is, however, somewhat more difficult to assign as the result of chance or coincidence. One night as I lay in bed half asleep and half awake, I heard these words inside my head. Yeah, but it's darned expensive. Who the devil's going to pay for it? Aren't there foundations or something to cover this sort of thing? The voice was instantly familiar to me as belonging to a friend who was out of town at the time. He sounded angry and shocked. I told Robert what I had heard, immediately wrote the words down, and noted the exact time and date. It was a few minutes past 1 a.m. The next day I tried to figure out what must have happened. The man's father was ill. Perhaps Mr. M was worried about a possible operation that his father might have to undergo. Three days later, my friend returned. As Robert and I visited with him, I asked about the father and was told that his condition was the same. He doesn't need an operation or anything, does he? I asked, puzzled. Mr. M answered in the negative. I was ready to forget the whole thing. Instead, luckily, I told Mr. and Mrs. M what I had heard. It was my turn to be surprised. The night of my experience, the M's had been in a resort area. They left a cocktail lounge at 1 a.m., the closing hour, to walk the short distance to their nearby motel. The motel manager walked with them. Outside, they found the grounds littered with junk. Vandals had thrown expensive lawn furniture into the swimming pool along with garbage. The area was in shambles. It was an answer to the manager's denunciation of the damage that Mr. M said, "'Yeah, but it's damned expensive. Damage.' Who the devil's going to pay for it? Aren't there foundations or something to cover this sort of thing? Coincidence seems a pretty weak explanation for this sort of incident. In some manner, I apparently tuned into a situation many miles away and picked up Mr. M's angry comment. Had this information been received in a dream, incidentally, it is very possible that I would have incorporated my own hospital explanation into the dream itself, distorting it beyond all recognition. For this reason, 
Whenever you write down such experiences, be certain that you record only the exact words that you hear. The following is another example which can hardly be attributed to chance or coincidence alone. It happened under the same circumstances as those in the Mr. M's case. It took place late at night. Again, I was half awake and half asleep. Suddenly, I realized that my mind contained the image of a newspaper article I had been reading it and comparing the information on it with another piece of paper. The article said that a friend Mr. X had been offered a given promotion at his place of business, that a reorganization would take place, and that another friend who also worked there, Mr. K, would also be involved. When I realized what was happening, the newspaper article and the other piece of paper both vanished. I wrote the information down at once and told Robert what I had seen. The following day, Mrs. X came to call. As best as I could, I related my experience and showed her the notations I had made. Surprised, she told me that her husband was being considered for promotion in his office, but the whole affair was highly secret. Only those directly concerned knew anything about it. Even most of the office staff was ignorant of the situation, but a reorganization was definitely taking place. She did not know that any change was planned for Mr. K. Two and a half weeks later, Mr. K was very suddenly transferred to another location due to the fact that another man had resigned his position. No newspaper article actually appeared, however, Mr. X did not accept the promotion offered. Both men worked at a newspaper office. This, I imagine, explains why I saw a newspaper article. By this means, the place of business was made clear to me. Experiencing a voice. This last instance involved sight rather than sound. I saw rather than heard the information. The following experience involved something with which I am sure many of my readers have been familiar in their own lives, a voice. How many times have you been certain that someone called your name when you were alone? And in most cases, we merely think that we are hearing things, shaking our heads, and forget the incident. Actually, I was working on this very chapter when suddenly I was certain that a woman called my name. The voice seemed to come from inside my head rather than from my physical environment. I looked out the window, however, to see if anyone was in the yard. It was empty. I was alone in the apartment. Most of the other tenants were at work. In any case, our apartment house is old and sturdy. Sounds do not carry. Because I have trained myself to make a note of such incidents, no matter how insignificant they seem, I wrote the experience down in my notebook and the time, 9.15 a.m. Then, forgetting it, I returned to my writing. Twenty minutes or so later, the impulse suddenly struck me to call my friend Mr. S. Naturally, I thought that this was my own idea, though it came out of the blue, so to speak. We do not have a phone. I used a neighbor's to make a call. Mrs. S. answered, telling me that she and her husband had just been speaking of me. She had some news she wanted to tell me, and she had been wishing that I had a phone so she could reach me. It wasn't until I returned to my typewriter that I remembered the woman's voice. I had heard Mrs. S. had told me that the conversation with her husband had begun when he came down for coffee a little after 9 a.m. The earlier notation concerning the voice had completely slipped my mind. On another occasion, as I sat working, I felt a sudden urge to call Peggy Gallagher, another friend, at the newspaper or to visit her there. Rarely do I leave the home once I have settled down to work. However, the impulse to see Peggy was a strong one. Looking at the clock, I saw that it was 9.30. Since I had begun working at 8 a.m., I decided that at 10, I would walk down to visit her. When she saw me, she told me she had been concentrating on me since 9.30 when I first felt the urge to see her. We had some business together and she had been anxious to contact me. Since I have no phone and she knew that I was working on this book, she decided to try telepathy. Again, I thought that going down to see her had been my own idea. Instances of what certainly seemed to involve telepathy have happened during the Seth sessions. One night, for example, Seth answered a witness questions before the man asked them. We had missed our regularly scheduled session the evening before Mr. Y, who was only an acquaintance at the time, dropped in to call. As we sat chatting with our guest, I felt that Seth wanted to make up the missed session. We never had a witness before. Nervously, I wondered what would happen. Seth was not at all concerned. The session began guest or no guest. We had a few minutes notice, so we gave our guest a brief idea of what the sessions were. Robert gave Mr. Y some paper and a pen for him to write down any questions that came to mind. 
He never got the chance to use the pen. Unknown to me, Seth answered all his questions in the order in which he thought them. No suggestion was given to our guest that Seth could or would do so. The idea had never entered our heads. The sessions were still very new to us at the time. Our guest was intrigued. He returned for a later session asking Seth about problems in his professional life. Seth answered in his usual lively fashion. Toward the end of the monologue, he mentioned that Mr. Y had abilities along electronic lines that were not being used and suggested he become a ham radio operator. When the session was over, Mr. Y told us that the basement of his house was filled with various kinds of electronic equipment. He had often thought of becoming a ham operator but had not done so because of the expense. Mr. Y lives in a distant city which we have never visited. We could not have seen his home. He had never mentioned his interest in electronics to us, nor did he seem like a man who would have such interests. Telepathy and Clairvoyance The term telepathy has been used mainly to express what can best be called thought transference, without communication through usual methods. Clairvoyance has generally been used to express extrasensory knowledge of future events, but in my experience, the two are so closely related that many times it is difficult to distinguish between them. Nor do the particular terms themselves matter. They only serve to make an artificial distinction in what is basically one ESP function. Since the two designations are in general use, however, we will use them here. There are certain characteristics that seem to be involved with instances of both clairvoyance and telepathy. Before we discuss some experiments for you to try on your own, let us consider some of these characteristics. Extrasensory perceptions in general seem to occur when the conscious mind is diverted. Conscious concentration is apt to inhibit such phenomena. Telepathy seems to have an emotional basis in many instances. We appear to pick up the thoughts of those with whom we are psychologically close. Probably we cannot will ourselves to transmit or receive a telepathic communication. We can, I believe, allow ourselves to do so. It is important that you become familiar with those parts of the mind through which such communications must come. Experiments for you. Here is a simple experiment for 10 minutes. Each day, sit or lie quietly. Listen to your own conscious thoughts. Do not tamper with them or judge them. Just listen, objectively. This is your stream of consciousness, the flow of thoughts that rush through your mind almost constantly. Sometimes we are aware of them, but usually only when we are quiet. When you have learned to distinguish this stream of consciousness, ignore it. You will then discover disconnected thoughts and images just beneath. You may hear words that seem meaningless. You may see pictures glow and fade. Pretend that your mind is like an ocean. You are traveling in a diving outfit slowly down into it. First you pass the stream of consciousness which flows just beneath the surface. Then, you reach the next level where the thoughts and images are less familiar like exotic fish dancing past. Do not attempt to grab hold of these words or images, or they will elude you. Simply observe them. You will need all your powers of perception. You may hear voices, they may be clear enough to hear for a moment, then fade away. Be patient. Do not strain to see or hear, quietly observe and listen. When you grow used to this experience, then you will become acclimated to the new conditions. You may discover that certain images will last longer than others. You may see them more clearly. Words that seem jumbled before may now be distinct. They may involve, as my friend's words did for me, situations existing in present time, but miles away in space. They may involve the future or the past. Until you listen and watch, you will never know. Some images will simply be meaningless. Sometimes you will see or hear nothing. Some pictures may involve people whom you do not know. They may be the result of imagination, or they may be concerned with valid perceptions of actual people which are relatively impossible to check upon. If you hear voices you recognize, or words that make sense, write them down. If you see images of acquaintances or friends, write a description of what you see. Later, make an attempt to question the people concerned as to the meaning of your experience. Many times, I could not know I was receiving a legitimate information until I checked with the persons involved. You cannot take it for granted that images or words have validity unless you are able to verify them in one way or another. 
the experiment itself will allow you to reach for the same sort of suspension between waking and sleeping that you ordinarily experience in bed at night. This is a state in which telepathic communications may be most often received and in which some of mine have occurred. All the words and images will not be telepathic by any means. Some may be simple subconscious fabrications, the inner mind at spontaneous play. Practice will undoubtedly help you develop some ability to distinguish between perceptions coming from various sources. My own experience allows me to discriminate somewhat in selecting which images are significant and which are not. Objective and systematic checking of such information remains the only definite way to establish validity. Actually, your intuitive feeling about any given experience may be more reliable than your conscious evaluation. Several times I discounted words that popped into my head when I was in this suspended state, discarding them because they seemed unlikely to have meaning. Later when events happened to back them up, I was at a loss because I had neglected to write them down. At other times I was certain that the same sort of information was valid and when I checked with the persons involved, it was not. Our next experiments involve another notebook. This notebook should soon become as intriguing and important to you as your dream notebook. Not only that, but you may discover as I did that similarities exist between your dreams and the incidents you will record. Earlier, we discussed those seemingly insignificant occurrences that frequently startle us with their resemblance to inner thoughts we have had immediately before the events happen. Almost everyone has experienced such cases in his own life. How many times have you thought of a particular friend only to have him or her ring you up on the telephone at the same time or only seconds after the thought? How many times have you thought that someone called your name even though you were alone and no one was nearby to call out to you? From now on, write down all such instances. Date each entry. Record any strong hunches or thoughts that pop into your head if they seem unrelated to what you are doing at the time. Check constantly to see if there is any relationship between your hunches and daily events. If you hear someone call your name, write the fact down, then keep careful watch on events for the rest of the day. Someone may want to get in touch with you. You may get a letter or phone call that will make the reason for the voice clear. If the phone rings and you know who is calling before you pick up the receiver, make note of this include the name of the person who called and the date. How many times a week does this happen? Do you always know when certain people will call you on the telephone? Now that you are actually writing down such instances, do you discover that you were not right half as often as you thought you were? These questions you will be able to answer for yourself. Is there a correlation between your precognitive dreams and telepathic flashes? Are they both apt to be more numerous at certain times? Keep all these questions in mind. Check the two notebooks against each other. Answers to such queries can tell us much about the nature of the human personality and of the mind. Also, a lot of human work will remain undone. It is very difficult to prove that any one instance is a valid telepathic communication and each such event must be studied alone. But if significant experiences of this nature accumulate in your notebook, if they are faithfully and honestly recorded and carefully checked out, then the very bulk of the material itself may suggest that telepathy and not coincidence is involved. Many of my clairvoyant dreams are implemented by telepathic flashes. Often, the information received in dreams is reinforced by words I hear in my head. It seems to make no difference whether the dream or telepathic flash happens first in time. When two such instances occur, both pertaining to the same physical event, then, to me, this adds to the validity of both the dream and the telepathic flash. You may very well find the same sort of connection between some of your precognitive dreams and words or thoughts that come to you while you are doing something else. Only by keeping careful records, however, can you discover such similarities. It is precisely because ESP is apt to be spontaneous that we must be so disciplined in our recording of it. More will be said later. Concerning the reinforcement that seems to occur between various extrasensory perceptions. Experiments with Extrasensory Perception Our next experiment involves the use of official ESP cards for the testing of extrasensory perception. These can be purchased through the mail from the Parapsychology Department, Duke University, Durham, North Carolina. Instructions are included for the very small price of $1. 
25 record sheets come with the cards and the cards can be used for several different tests. It is possible to make up your own set of cards, but there are good reasons for purchasing the official ones. For one thing, the cards are absolutely uniform in size and thickness. The backs are opaque and identical, lessening the possibility that subconscious cues might be received that would affect the scores. The pack is composed of 25 cards made up of five symbols, star, waves, cross, or plus sign, circle, and square. When you get the cards, you should construct a small screen of heavy cardboard or any such suitable material to shield the person who gives the test, the operator from the person who takes the test, the subject. The operator handles the cards and the subject tries to ascertain the way they fall in the deck. All scores are written down on the record sheets. A chance score running through the cards once one run would be five. Chances alone then would allow the subject to guess five out of the 25 cards correctly. Anything above this score would be considered as being above chance. However, a minimum often runs is necessary and preferably many more. On the first three runs, for example, you may get a high score, while your score for the next seven runs could go below chance, cutting your total score considerably. I suggest that you run through the cards frequently. Note in your records the mood you were in when you took each test, the time of the day the test was tried, even the condition of the weather. We simply do not know how ESP works and what various conditions influence it. Your own results can answer many questions for you. Do you do better with the cards when you are in a good mood, a bad mood? Does the weather seem to have any effect on your senses? If science could discover the conditions in which extrasensory perceptions operate best, then experiments could be set up that would be most useful in the attempt to put ESP on some kind of predictable basis. Try the cards out on relatives and friends. Keep track of all scores. Do not run through the cards so many times at one sitting that you become tired. Always follow the instructions to the letter. If you got significant scores without the screen, for example, your scores should be discounted because the conditions for the tests were not properly complied with. In our own experiment with the cards, I once made the good score of calling 67 cards correctly on a clairvoyance test. For this particular test, the subject tries to guess the order of the cards in the pack as the pack lies face down on the table. The cards themselves are not touched. A score of 50 would have been chance. However, other scores in different runs lowered my total considerably. Robert once gave correct calls for 12 of 25 cards. We have not emphasized the cards in our investigations. Some workers in the field of ESP have had excellent results using the cards. Others have not. It is important that you keep your own initiative high and not become bored with the repetition. Try the tests in a spirit of fun. Extrasensory perceptions have spontaneous natures. Often they come when we least expect them. Have a scientific attitude when you judge the results of all the experiments in this book. First, however, you must allow yourself the inner freedom that is necessary to pick up perceptions that do not come through the physical senses. There are numerous experiments that you can initiate for yourself. For example, try having one person make a drawing of a simple object or symbol on a piece of paper while he is in another room. Then try to draw the exact object or symbol. Many may join this simple experiment. Always keep records. Number the original drawing, one or zero for original, or use any designation which will keep your records clear. And remember your notebook. Refuse to accept coincidence as the only explanation for everything you do not understand. Write such incidents in your records. Does it seem that your letters often cross other letters in the mail, for example? If you write a friend on Wednesday, do you often get a letter from him on Thursday, before he may even have received yours? Or is this only your imagination? Keep notes and find out for yourself. Don't take anything for granted. Try to contact a distant friend or relative without using the telephone or taking advantage of the more usual methods of communication. If you follow these experiments, if you take the time and effort to examine your own inner self, you may find yourself able to do just that. Following are some excerpts from the Seth material in which Seth discusses telepathy in general and the ways in which thoughts are transmitted from sender A to the receiver B. I have said there are no duplicates, yet you may say, are not some thought duplicates? The variations may indeed be slight, but variations are always present. 
A thought transmitted knowingly or unknowingly by A is not precisely the same thought when it reaches receiver B. The thought originally held by A is still retained by A, yet a seemingly identical thought reaches B. A has lost nothing, that is, in trying to send the thought in trying to duplicate the thought, A still retains it. So what is passed on to receiver B? This is rather important since an explanation will do much to account for the frequent difference that occurs in telepathic communications. Whether or not A, the sender, knowingly transmits this apparent duplicate at the point of transmission, the sender forms an electrical impulse pattern that is supposed to duplicate the original thought but no such identical duplication is possible as far as I know within reality of any kind. A side note, identical twins are hardly identical, for example. Soon as the attempt is made to duplicate the thought, we find the attempt itself strains and pulls. The impulse changes minutely or to a greater degree. The point I want to make is that any attempt at duplication actually forces the impulses to line up in a different pattern. When B receives the thought is already a new thought, bearing great resemblance to the original, but it is not the original thought. Prime identities cannot be duplicated. Exact duplication is always an effect of insufficient knowledge. In some cases, two thoughts may appear identical. But whether or not examination can show it, such exact duplication is impossible. Now when receiver B receives a transmitted thought, he may react and interpret that part of the thought that is similar to the original. He may, on the other hand, react to and interpret that portion of the thought that is not similar. He may react to and interpret the similarity or the difference. His reactions depend upon several circumstances, including the intensity of the electrical pulsations that compose the thought and his own inner facility to react to particular ranges of intensities. Habitually, individuals establish overall frequencies that they are able to handle for various reasons that I've explained earlier. An individual will therefore feel more at home operating within certain frequencies. The original thought is used as a pattern for the creation of a new electrical reality which may or may not be directed at any given receiver. It is obvious that the attempt to duplicate is present were it not for this attempt to duplicate then there would be little similarity between any separate identities. The nature of the thought that is received by B is determined by many factors. We shall consider but a few of these. These include the original intensity of the thought as A possesses it, A's ability to duplicate the thought as far as possible, the relative stability of the electrical thought unit as it is formed by A, the familiarity or unfamiliarity of the range of frequencies that compose the thought to any intended receiver. The receiver will understand and interpret, in general, the intensity range he is in the habit of using himself. Some or a portion of the transmitted thought may fall within his range and some may not. He may pick up the portions of the thought which are similar to the original thought, which are similar to the original thought in which case some scientific proof of sorts can be achieved. It can happen. However, that the dissimilarity is what falls within his particular custom range in which case proof will be inadequate. Now I've told you that emotions also possess an electrical reality. Thoughts formed and sent out within the impulse range of emotions often succeed because of the peculiar nature of the emotional electrical impulses themselves. They have a particularly strong electrical mass. They also usually fall within a powerful intensities for reasons we will not discuss now. Thoughts formed under a strong emotional impetus will carry greater vividness, have a greater tendency toward duplication, and are apt to be interpreted with some success. Also, all individuals have had familiarity with emotions as they exist within electrical intensities and are accustomed to reacting to them. The whole process is instantaneous. However, the thought which is now an approximation of the original thought and actually an identity of its own, that thought is changed once more by the receiver himself. He does not actually interpret the thought itself. He interprets its meaning and forms a new thought identity. In our last session, I told you this. Action, the very action of transmission, alters the nature and electrical reality of the thought itself. 
To repeat, our imaginary sender A does not transmit a given thought. He does not even send an exact duplicate, nor does the receiver receive the thought in the same condition. The original thought is retained by A. A forms a thought as nearly identical as possibilities allow it to be. This he transmits to B, but B can't receive the thought in its present condition, for the action of receiving a thought also changes it. He forms a thought as nearly identical as possible for him and interprets it. Action can never be considered apart from that which is seemingly acted upon, for action becomes part of structure. Action begins from within, and it is a result of inner vitality inherent in all realities. Action is not a thing alone. It is not an identity. Action is a dimension of existence. And that is the chapter on telepathy by Jane Roberts. Super fascinating discussion. The thing that I am most interested in is how to differentiate my thoughts. And we get some discussion on how to do that here. Many times, I promise you, you have had thoughts and done things that were not your thoughts. You thought they were your thoughts, but they were not your thoughts. And oftentimes, we're walking around thinking we're thinking thoughts, but they're actually not our own thoughts. We're picking up on the thoughts of others and thinking those thoughts are our own thoughts. Unfortunately, this can be very powerful. And one person can transmit thoughts and control large groups of people. And I also believe pendulums have a role in this as well. So going within and analyzing your thoughts and going below that stream of consciousness in the exercise she mentioned here is really powerful. There's a stream of consciousness of you thinking and then under that is another stream of consciousness of the collective consciousness. And as you delve into that other area that goes beyond your stream of consciousness, you will begin to discover how to maneuver through it, how to access it, how to differentiate the different thoughts that you access. This is an ongoing process. We do not have fourth density bodies, so we're learning how to see with just pinholes, and it's just what we have to accept in this density. But I promise the light still comes in through those pinholes, and eventually you can start to kind of understand the difference between light and dark, and then the vividness of the thoughts that you're receiving. So there's some importance into remembering if you're having a thought, is it your thought? Listening to that voice, following your hunches and intuitions and journaling this stuff. The more you journal it, the more you become aware of the naturalness of your extrasensory abilities and how they work. Please leave in the comments your personal experiences with reading thoughts, with hearing thoughts and sending thoughts, all of it. I'm interested in all of it. And so anybody else that is accessing this video, check out those comments, treat it like a laboratory of telepathy, and we can learn how to improve on this ability that I believe is going to become more and more pronounced as more and more young kids grow up and there's going to be a change in consciousness. There's a natural telepathy that we're already experiencing when we feel other people's emotions. The empathy that we're feeling is just the beginnings of this telepathy, and soon it will become more vivid. It may drive some people crazy. It may empower many people. How is it going to affect you? You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.